Hello, thank you for joining me for our Bible study today. Today we are in the latter portion of 1 John chapter 2. We're actually beginning with verse 18 and going through the remainder of the chapter. Uh, the key word that we're going to look at today is Antichrist. And I want you to understand that sometimes, and John is the only one who used the word in the scriptures. And sometimes, whenever he referred to an Antichrist, uh, uh, he was referring to the one Antichrist at the end of the age, at the, uh, uh, during the last generation of time after the church has been raptured. But then there are other times that he's talking about many Antichrists. And we're going to look at that today. And uh, whenever we think of that prefix, anti we typically think of the word against. The prefix in our English vocabulary, anti, means against. And uh, we think of maybe those religions that are militant against Christians and against Jesus. But uh, that prefix in the scriptures, it can also mean instead of. And so we all know that many times there are uh, philosophies, and although these philosophies are sincere, they are not accurate. They are not truthful. And, and that brings up the question, just how important is the truth? Which is more important, that we be completely truthful or that we be completely sincere. I want you to be thinking about that as I read this passage of Scripture. Beginning in verse 18, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, uh, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know this is the last hour. So notice he distinguishes between the various Antichrists and the one uh, at the very end of the last generation on earth. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Notice that. John says, no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, and whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, and if it does, you will also remain in the Son and in the Father, and this is what he promised us, even eternal life. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach him, to teach you rather. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. I want us to begin our lesson today, and we've got a lot to cover. I want us to begin our lesson today on two aspects of this passage. The first was verse 18. He says, Dear children, this is the last hour. You've heard that the Antichrist is coming, and even now there's already many Antichrists who have come. That's how we know it's the last hour. So that's one thought that we will be uh, really exhausting in these next few minutes. And the other uh, is that statement that I said a little bit earlier. No lie can come from the truth. And, and uh, so now let's revisit that question that I asked you earlier. Which is more important, uh, sincerity or the truth? 
And the fact is, the truth, the absolute 100% unadulterated truth is of utmost importance in regard to our faith. And we cannot be sincere uh, uh, about what is right until we know the truth as it is delivered to us. So it's very important that we as Christians, as we seek to build a sincere faith, that we build it according to the exact truth. Uh, there are a lot of philosophies and a lot of even churches that say, uh, believe it or not, there's churches that teach, well, you don't really have to go through Jesus to get to heaven. You just have to model Jesus' actions. And, and we know that that is a fabrication of the truth. And uh, Jesus made the statement that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. So we know that Jesus is the only way. And so we need to learn to be sincere about that. So, so let me give you a few examples. I, I believe that we can even look at God's law in nature and, and see that the truth is of vital importance to us today. Uh, let's say that you are in a hospital and uh, there is a nurse who is about to treat you and, and you're violently ill and the nurse is very sincere about the medicine that she should give you but it's the wrong medicine and you have a reaction to it and die which was more important the truth or sincerity now, let's use another example. A man is sleeping at night and he suddenly, he was woken up by a, a sudden noise. And he gets up, he goes downstairs, and he sees what he assumes to be a burglar. And he takes his pistol and he shoots the burglar, but whenever the light comes on, it was his daughter who was hungry and she'd gotten up to get something to eat. Now, the man was sincere about what he saw. But what's more important? The truth or sincerity? Well, let's take one more illustration. Let's say that you are traveling from New York to Chicago but you happen to be on a highway that will take you straight to Los Angeles. Now, will sincerity get you to Chicago? No, it won't. No. A recalculation of the map and the truth of where you're going. That's what will get you to your determined destination. And, and, and so uh, I, I think that we need to understand that in, in light of all of this, uh, uh, again, uh, the word anti and antichrist, uh, uh, it can be two, mean two things. The word anti can mean against, or the word anti can mean instead of. Uh, at least that's how it's transferred uh, in the scriptures as well. And so John makes that statement in verse 18 that... Uh, this is the last hour, and he even says, many antichrists have already come. So let's just take those two thoughts, and let's merge them together for just a second. Many, many antichrists have already come. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to two or three different thoughts. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, uh, uh, many shall come in my name and shall deceive many. Uh, so he teaches us in Matthew 24 that there are in the latter days or, or in the last days that there will be many who rise up saying that they have the way to heaven. And uh, let me just share with you that any individual who has come up since Jesus saying that we need Jesus and them to get to heaven, uh, 
they are a part of the Antichrist that Jesus was describing. And, and we need to remember that uh, Jesus Christ was the last one. How do we know that? Uh, there is a parable that Jesus taught uh, in Matthew chapter 21. This was right after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem after Palm Sunday, so it would have been during the last week of his life. He began teaching, and it was the parable of the tenants. And uh, many of you are probably very familiar with the story. Uh, it's also included, I think, in Luke chapter 20. But in Matthew chapter 21, it uses some verbiage that I think is, uh, is more helpful to our cause today. But uh, uh, the Bible says that there was this landowner who, who rented out his vineyards and, and he went off to a far country. And he, uh, whenever it came time for the harvest, he wanted to get his rent from the harvest. And so he sent uh, some of his servants. And so whenever his servants arrived, uh, they stoned one, they beat another. And so he sent more servants. And uh, similar things happened to them. And as he perplexed how he was going to uh, get his rent for the harvest, he said, I know what I'll do. Last of all, I'll send my son. So it says, last of all, he sent his son. And whenever his son was approaching, the uh, tenants saw him coming and said, Look, there is the heir. Let's kill him and take the inheritance. Now, I want you to notice a key part in Matthew's rendering of that gospel. The parable was to teach us a heavenly meaning about the coming of God's kingdom. And it clearly said, last of all, he sent his son. And the intent and the meaning of that parable is, this is the last thing that God is going to do to provide redemption for mankind. Those servants that were stoned and beaten, they represented the giving of the law. And, and I, just recently, my Bible reading took me through... Um, of the story of the Exodus, and, uh, and, and then also reading in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and, and just reading about the Israelites there in the wilderness. Uh, I, I want to tell you what, it was an awful, awful 40 years for those people. You know, God's blessing was right at their fingertips, but their lack of faith, uh, they, they were just cruel to one another, and, and it's such a sad thing. Well, God gave the law to help uh, define, and he even rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt, but they did not appreciate it. And as a result, uh, it was almost as if they were a, a pain in the very neck of God. And then we find that God was still persistent in his love for them. He sent them judges. He even gave them kings. And then at the end of the Old Testament covenant, at the end of the Old Covenant, uh, he provided them prophets who would tell them the story about the coming of the Messiah, about the coming of Jesus, hundreds of years before it would ever happen. And then when the fullness of time had come, like uh, the book of Galatians 4.4 4 teaches us, last of all, God sent his son. And so this is the last thing that God is going to, re to do to redeem mankind. So the scripture says we are in the last hour. It means we've passed the last hour. Jesus has died for our sins. He was buried for our sins. He has risen again for our sins. And this is the last thing that God is going to do in the area of redemption to provide salvation for us. Whenever Jesus said, it is finished, it was. The plan of salvation was complete. Whenever Jesus said, it, it is finished, he not only meant that his suffering was over and, and he didn't have to suffer in his human body any longer, he more significantly meant, I've completed what I came here to accomplish. It is completed. I died the sacrificial death and everything that God sent me to do, I have completed it. And I've turned it all unto the Father. I've turned it all over to my Father. So that's why uh, uh, one of the Gospels also says 
that uh, uh, he gave up his ghost or, or he surrendered his body up to God and, and, and died and he breathed his last. So, so, uh, so just think about that. Anything that teaches a story that does not include Jesus Christ as the very author of redemption, as being the only way to salvation and the only way to heaven and to God, Anyone who does not teach that in its complete truth, the Bible says, according to John, that they are a part of the Antichrist. I want to remind you that after uh, Jesus had uh, uh, risen again, and after he had ascended, and shortly after the day of Pentecost, the church in Jerusalem had grown to about 8,500 people, and uh, and so they really became a threat to the Pharisees. And so the religious leaders of the day arrested Peter and John. And uh, they were going to put them to death. But uh, some of them were afraid of what the people might do if they executed uh, uh, Peter and John. And so whenever they were trying to make their decision... Finally, in Acts chapter 5, we read that there was a respected teacher of the law by the name of Gamaliel. And uh, he spoke up, and he, and he says, you know, guys, he said, there was this uh, guy a few years ago by the name of Theudas, and he had a following of about 400 people. But whenever he died... All of his followers disbanded, and we never heard of him anymore. And then in the days of the census, there was this man by the name of Judas, and uh, he had a band of followers, but someone killed him, and once he died, uh, we never heard of his followers anymore. And then he goes on to say, uh, this same Jesus, if there's nothing to Jesus, we need to let these men go. Because if there's nothing of this Jesus, then this too will pass. And now that Jesus is dead and gone, his followers will soon be dispersed. But if this Jesus is real and is really the Son of God, we do not want to be found fighting God. And so the Bible says that they beat Peter and John and then they let them go. And, and, and they praised the Lord that they were counted worthy uh, to suffer for our Lord. Now, what's amazing is, here we are, uh, you are sitting in your living room right now, or most of you are anyway, and, and, and you are participating in this Bible study all these years later, and who are we worshiping? We are worshiping Jesus, and I believe that the words of Gamaliel have come true. If this man is of God, we don't want to be found fighting God, and it will last. And it has last, lasted for generations and generations and generations, proving that Jesus is the Christ. You know, there's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, any, any teacher today that teaches you that you need a separate book other than the Bible to be saved, uh, uh, that's where the danger steps in. If you'll remember in the book of Revelation, in the very last pages of the Bible, uh, there are promised plagues. Uh, God promises plagues uh, to those generations and those people who do not take uh, the prophecy seriously and they leave things out. And then they, uh, there are promised plagues to those who add to the message. And uh, you and I know that there are groups out there today who are adding books, saying that these books are necessary for salvation, and these books are, are outside of the Bible. And uh, they are looked upon by these various groups as additions to the Bible. And, and we need to be concerned about that. We need to be very, very concerned about that because... Uh, uh, the book of Revelation at the very end of the Bible warns us against adding any new prophecies because the days of the prophecies were completed uh, in the book of John's Revelation. So, so we, we, we need to remember that. Now, uh, as we think about uh, 
the last hour, uh, I want to remind you that whenever it said last of all, God sent his son. So the last hour, it means uh, uh, the day, the last thing, the day following uh, uh, the day of redemption. Whenever Jesus died on a cross, rose again, and, and, and so now, beginning that day, we were in the latter days. We were in the last times. And the reason they're referred to as the latter days, even though they have concluded, they have continued for 2,000 years, is because everything's done. Nothing more is going to be added uh, to the theology of God's Word. We have our completed Bible now. And nothing is going to be added to it. Nothing's going to be taken away from it. And so now we are in the last days. There's nothing more to be done. Now Jesus can come back at the time that the Father tells him to come back. And, and so, uh, so, but in these closing moments of this Bible study today, I, I just want to point out two or three things to you. There are three things that you will notice uh, with false teachers. There are three things that you will notice with people who are teaching about other Christ and the need uh, for new prophets in a new day and age. Uh, first of all, they will depart from the fellowship of the local church. They will withdraw from the fellowship of the local church. Uh, in verse 19 of our text today, the scripture says, uh, and, and uh, John writes, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. You know, they, they weren't really a part of us. They left us, but they're not really a part of us. If they would have been a part of us, they would have stayed with us. Now, I want to remind you that Jesus told Peter that on this rock he would build his church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And, and he told him that in the latter year of his ministry, uh, on earth. Now what's interesting is that uh, he prepared Peter for what was about to happen because uh, I really like Luke's gospel. Uh, he told them to remain in Jerusalem until they are endued with this power from on high. And he had already taught them enough to know that this power from on high, he taught them on the night of his betrayal, this power from on high would be the deliverance of his Holy Spirit. And that would happen on the day of Pentecost, and it would usher in the day of the church. So Jesus had told Peter that he would be instrumental in beginning the church, and that the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against the church. And so Jesus set in motion for the church to be the tool through which Christians would save the world. He has chosen us to be that tool. He has chosen us to remain with the church and be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus to a lost and dying world who needs him. And we are to do it through the tool that Jesus established. Now, I'm here to tell you today that if you go from one congregation to the next, you'll find out that no church is perfect. Matter of fact, there are a lot of flaws in the church today, and probably more so in the last couple of generations. But by the same token, this, this was the tool that Jesus chose to use. And he said that whenever Christians would function properly as a church, that we could go out and deliver the gospel message and the gates of hell will not hold up to the power of the message that we speak. And, and, and so uh, one of the key signs of noticing that uh, someone is a false teacher is if they are eager to leave the body of believers called the church so that they do not have any sense of accountability other than themselves. So, so now notice that. You know, here I am, the pastor of a church, and I've been called to lead our church, but by the same token, I am held to a responsibility, not only by God, but under the church members that I serve. We keep one another accountable. 
we keep one another accountable and as a result we try to stay uh, in the exact teaching of the Word of God. Now I want you to notice something here too that whenever someone departs from the fellowship it's not long before they are denying the faith that they once held. They start claiming a new faith. They start claiming a new teaching. And you know that's pretty easy to do because if you deny the fellowship you're not only accountable to that fellowship any longer but pretty soon uh, the teaching is uh, the teaching from that fellowship, the teaching from that church is only a faint memory and, and, and you find yourself uh, denying the faith. Uh, I remember a dear friend of mine and, and uh, Patty if you're watching today uh, uh, I, I've told this to your face and, and I just say this to your credit but a dear friend of mine uh, that was at our church in Tennessee uh, she spent several years in California, and uh, uh, while she was out there, she was in and out of church. Her dad had been a Baptist minister, and whenever she moved back to Tennessee and started in attending our church there, she was very eager in what I was teaching. And But yet, I noticed that in those uh, first four, five, six months, uh, she was remarkably liberal. And, and why would that have been? Well, because she had spent a season of time that uh, she was not under sound teaching. And so as a result of that, uh, she uh, departed from the fellowship of God's people for a season of time in her life, and she was very close to denying the true faith that her father had taught her. Now, I want you to know that today, uh, this lady uh, generally has a... Uh, uh, a Bible study on Mondays for uh, uh, for ladies from time to time throughout the year and uh, and she is very 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 sound uh, in the scriptures and she teaches the Bible for what it says but this tells us why it is so important for us to stay connected with the church I would like to share with those of you who are watching this broadcast that you've not been able to come back uh, to Mount Zion uh, because of the coronavirus, I, I would just share with you that these teachings on Wednesday and on Sunday morning are uh, extremely, extremely, extremely important because you don't want the message from the church to become only a faint whisper to you. You want that until that time that you can come back and, and be in physical fellowship with us again, you need to stay in the very, very uh, solid teaching of God's Word. Not that I am the best teacher in the world, but that you need to uh, be following somebody that is teaching the Bible for what it says. And then, uh, not only once somebody goes the step of departing from the fellowship, and then if they go all the way to the point that they deny the faith into the part that they're saying, you know what, uh, the resurrection of Jesus is not the only way uh, through which you can find salvation. Whenever they go that far, pretty soon they start developing other teachings and they will start deceiving the faithful. If you notice the cults that go out today, the majority of their effort is to go to people who are connected with the church and they try to deceive the faithful. They try to cast doubt in the minds of the average church member. Now, what's sad about this is the people that come to your door and knock on your door and try to evangelize you uh, into their way of thinking, uh, what is sad is most of the people, most of the church members even, who answer those doors are ill-prepared. Uh, you know, I, I can remember that uh, somebody... Uh, I came in contact with a book one time uh, on the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses and there were some things there that I noticed that uh, I never knew before and I began finding out that whenever they would knock on my door I could engage in them with conversation and whenever I began pointing out their many 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 false prophecies 
uh, based on this book that I had read, uh, I, I found out that they really did not have any interest in talking to me at all because they did not see me as being someone that they could cast doubt in my mind or someone that they could deceive. So, uh, so I, I want you to realize that in this passage of Scripture that we've looked at today, um, John has been teaching us many Antichrists are already in this world, and that will continue to be so until that day, that last generation, uh, before this world is finally judged, uh, uh, until that day that the final Antichrist is here that becomes the, the world ruler. I want to remind you of just a few encouraging words that John shared with us. He said, you have the anointing from the Holy One. Now, so he's saying, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's already there. You don't need a new anointing. You don't need a special anointing. Uh, I, I've quoted Elvis Markham uh, a number of times uh, since I've been at Mount Zion. And, and my favorite statement that he ever made was, uh, he said, uh, everything that you're ever going to receive from the Holy Spirit, you will receive it on the day that, uh, that you are saved. And then he made this statement. He said, our call for the remainder of our lives is to begin utilizing or tapping in to what God has already provided. So John is affirming that in this passage of Scripture. He's saying, you already have the anointing, so learn how to appropriate what you've already been given. And you do that through the study of the Word, through prayer, uh, through the fellowship with the other believers, and you are reminded that no lie ever comes from the truth. No lie. And so, uh, so John says he teaches us these things so that we won't be led astray. I hope that this lesson today has been helpful for you, and, uh, and I hope it speaks to your heart in a very, very real uh, and special way. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you.